Wow, what an incredible presentation from John. I don't know about you guys, but my mind is absolutely blown. And uh, I'm a little bit nervous as well as a journalist. You know, I feel that AI will one day be coming for my job. But as a massive tech advocate, just listening to everything that John Sanai just said on that stage is just absolutely incredible. Very excited for the future. Um, we're not quite talking tech, um, but we do have a fantastic um, topic or subject that we're about to discuss on stage with this lovely group of panelists. We are, of course, talking talking about the Global Youth Index. Now, back in May 2022, um, this was launched by the MISC Foundation. It's the second edition of the Global Youth Index. Now, just to bring you guys up to scratch or up to speed, the GYI is this incredible trailblazing tool for youth leaders, policymakers, and the global community. It essentially delivers insights on the challenges and opportunities for youth development across 30 countries. And it essentially gives those people insight into how young people see, perceive what's happening in their own territories, in their own countries, across key areas like employment, um, education and skills, and entrepreneurship. So helping me discuss uh, the Global Youth Index, I have a brilliant bunch of panelists. So on my left, I have Otman al Y20 Chair, um, an ITU Generation Connect board member here in Saudi. We have Ella Tree, Trin, sorry, co-founder and CEO of medtech startup Vulcan Augmetics in Vietnam. And last but certainly not least, we have Zuria Odoale, Global Education Advocate and Presidential Advisor for the DUS USU Foundation in the US. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. How are you? Quite good. Pumped and ready? Yeah, of Absolutely. course. Okay, so we don't have much time, so I'm going to dive straight in. So generation transformation, you know, this is the theme of this fantastic event. Um, and it aims to foster this transformative mindset, which is essential to unleashing the unlimited potential of youth everywhere. So I guess my first question is, what, why is this topic so important that it requires its own platform, its own event? Yeah. Otman, I'm going to come to you first. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, hayalla uh, shabab. It's good to see so many familiar faces, and for those who I'm not familiar with, who are young, we have a long future. If you're not young, let's be connected quite quickly. Uh, so when we're talking about young people in general and why this topic needs its own platform, we have to ask ourselves first, is that how much actually are young people a part of the global population? And when we were thinking about that and we did this research, we found that about 90% about of the world's population comes from young, or about 50% of the world's population are younger than 30, 90% of which come from developed, developing countries. And so there is a huge quantitative element to including young people in decision making and improving their lives. Now, from a quality perspective, it also makes sense that when you improve the lives of young people, generations afterwards will be improved as well. And so it behooves us to create a better life for our children, hence why it is so important for entities like MISC Foundation to really work on a tool such as the Global Youth Index. Yeah, absolutely. Some very valid points there. Ladies, have you got anything to add to that? You know. Yeah, um, I can start us off. And um, just to put things into perspective, that probably help a bit. Um, I arrived from Los Angeles just yesterday um, <laughs> here for MISC. And normally this time of year, I'd be at COP. So this year it's COP27 in Egypt, um, just because I'm advising a couple government leaders on their climate communication strategy. And so that's where I'd normally be. And so when you talk about why it's such important to, so important to have a platform such as this to discuss youth and transformation, I mean, so you have to ask why did I pass on COP? Right, there's 50,000 attendants, 80 world leaders. And it's because I've grown to realize that the answers are no longer where they used to be. Mm -hmm they're where they're supposed to be, which is in the future. And the future is today's younger generation. If you want insight into what a tree would look like tomorrow, you have to look at the seed today, mm -hmm. right? You don't go to the established forest to predict the future, because that forest is already built. There's nothing else that it can do. And so I think that's a mistake that a lot of the world makes. And it's so important to have platforms such as this and to allow youth voices to really amplify. Last, oh, this September, um, I was in New York at the UN for General Assembly Week. And I was there, I met with three prime ministers from the Caribbean region to talk about climate strategy. And you have to ask, why would they meet with me? You know, just a girl from California. And you know, that's an example of them looking at the sea today in order to solve their climate challenges tomorrow. 
those leaders, they're all in COP, like I said, but I felt like it was so important to come here to Saudi just to share these insights into the future. Because youth, I think, are the most powerful weapon we have in our arsenal to solve a lot of the world's socioeconomic problems for three reasons. First, we take a lot of risks, right? <laughs> and so with that, the results and the rewards are a lot more. And second, we don't really have an agenda other than to just solve a lot of the global issues that we see. And the third and most important thing that I think is that we live and breathe the creativity that fuels our passion for development and for change. And so to have a platform like this where we can really focus on it, I think it's just so important and so crucial. Absolutely. And, you know, as someone who's probably a little bit older than you guys, it's really, really nice to see that things are being shaken up now. It's no longer this tried and tested model that we've been basically living off and learning off for the past however many years. It's time to do things a bit differently, recalibrate and shake it up. And it really does start with the youth. And I love that tree analogy with, you know, it starts from the seeds. I really, I really do love that. So obviously youth, incredibly, incredibly important. But what are some of the key challenges that are facing youth today? Mm. Ella, have you got anything to add? Yes, I can start. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ella from Vietnam. Uh, personally, I run in a robotic arm startup uh, serving people with disability in Vietnam. So I represent not only the youth from developing nations, but also a more underprivileged group, uh, people with disability. So uh, talking about challenges, uh, there's so many challenges that we can talk about today. But for me as an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur who's running a make tech startup, um, the first uh, challenge of myself and my team is um, battling every day is um, source of capital. Yes. When we talk about running a, a startup and especially a make tech startup, um, angels investor or uh, VCs tend to place their bit in a more experienced uh, entrepreneur or, you know, expert. And that's, there's nothing wrong about it. But when it comes into innovation that is so much, you know, like so emerging, robotics, augmentation technology, there is feels that even though there's expert, but they just refuse to make the change. They are afraid to take risk. The young generation have less agenda and less, have less thing to fail. So when we talk about challenges, uh, it's more of yeah, the capital in general, but it's the opportunity that the young generation like me would like to have uh, in entrepreneurship, in startup. So capital and the the chance to fail and the chance to be trusted in innovation, in technology, is the challenge that we are going through right now. Yeah, absolutely. Otman, do you have anything yeah. to add? What are some of the challenges you identify? Sure. sure. I think on a, a macro level from the Global Youth Index, when we asked young people what do they care about the most in terms of solving um, or what they see around the world, and I think three of them really come up. Uh, one of them is, on a macro level, is peace and security. The other is human rights and then uh, poverty. But when you ask them the same question, what do they see on a local level, the questions or the answers that come up are really focused on employment, poverty come up, comes up, and also corruption. Now, my work in the Y20, we see 20 delegations from all over the world come in to try to decide what are the key policies they want to convince G20 leaders to adopt and the leaders communicate every single year. And over the past four years, we see a clear divide between developed countries' youth and developing countries' youth. So developed countries' youth, they come in with the concept of uh, climate change or climate action, taking care of the environment and so on. And then developing countries, the most challenges that come up is entrepreneurship, funding, um, uh, employment, uh, development of skills, education. And so seeing these trends coming up is, is really, really interesting. I think one of the silver linings to these challenges is, or, or what has really exacerbated those challenges is COVID-19, right? Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of or the onset of COVID-19, there was a lot of uncertainty. Um, and so we, many countries uh, faced a lot of challenges with how do we then transition the educational system? What about jobs? Mm -hmm. And one thing we called it the hidden pandemic um, it was actually mental health for young people. And, you know, taking, especially for K through 12, taking 
students away from their social lives and locking them or including them into their homes for days, weeks, months at a time really affected how they um, interacted afterwards. Now, coupling that with, there are also silver linings to this, which is young people are also digital natives. So as Ella mentioned, there is a lot of focus for young people and a lot of engagement that could happen from their ability to really hack through to the digital native arena and become really efficient um, at utilizing digital technologies to solve the challenges that we see today. So that's one silver lining. The other silver lining is uh, what the previous speaker has mentioned is adaptability. And this comes with the risk angle as well, which is young people are much more likely to adapt to the current challenges that we face today, right? And so whatever you throw at them and whatever is coming again also in the future is huge challenges that will come faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And so young people today have this adaptability element that is baked into their lives. And so learning to learn and learning to unlearn is really important as well. Yes, that resilience is so important, isn't it? So I'm going to skip ahead of some questions because we are steaming through time. Um, what would you tell young people in the audience, you know, the global audience watching, how can we enable policymakers to essentially understand what youth need and enable that? Maybe I can take a stab at this one. Um, when it comes to youth and policymakers, I think the biggest thing is just helping policymakers to see that we have ideas, right? It's not just a voice, we're not just making noise just because we have ideas. And like I mentioned, there's so much creativity and innovation in this next generation that we think about problems differently. You know, an example in the work that I do, I'm a girls' education advocate, so I do a lot of work around the world trying to get out-of-school girls back into schools. And one thing that I've realized, and I'm sure you all have heard every single year, UNESCO, UNICEF, they have this large number of out-of-school children, right? Somewhere, I think this year, it's around 250 million. And for the past few years, it's been hovering around that number, 220 million, 240, but it's still growing. And so I believe that if we begin to change the metrics that we use to measure child's cognitive development, and we shift our focus from schooling to education, I think that we can see some real change. You know, there's tens of thousands of communities across the African continent, across Asia, where there's no formal school. So how can you ask children to go to what doesn't exist? And in some places where there are schools, children have to walk five, 10 miles one way. And by the time they get to school, they're exhausted, they're hungry. So how can we expect them to learn? And so what I've realized is it's not just about focusing on school, because school is the brick and mortar traditional building, right? You go there, you learn science, you learn history. But if we start to educate these children and not just focus on sending them to school, then we can teach them skills that they can use to take care of themselves instead of just mandating they go to school when in situations that's just impossible, yeah. right? And you know, another thing that I do, I'm a filmmaker. And so I took this concept and back in 2016, when I was 13 years old, I started a filmmaking workshop. So I teach basic film and editing schools to girls, to out-of-school youth, and to unemployed women. Because I started a film when I was nine, and I was completely self-taught. Wow. So I believe that with the right opportunities, others could do exactly the same. So I started that workshop, and the very first class that I held, just nine months after it, one of the young women who attended, she went out, she borrowed a camera, and she took the skills that she learned and made her own documentary. And she got to shop it around to TV networks. That's a project I've now taught to over 530 students, somewhere around there um, in countries like Ghana, Mexico, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. And this all goes back to allowing the youth to use their ideas, use their innovation. I mean, climate is another great example. It's another area where we youth can really use our voices to make a difference. Yeah. You know, countries have been using the exact same narrative the past 26 cops, right? This is year 27. So obviously things have to change. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the focus, while it's on funding and, and money, you know, there's a slow emerging crisis in the educational sector because now it's raining in places where it never used to rain before, and it's snowing in places it never used to snow. Like here in Saudi a few months back, sand dunes were covered in snow. 
I mean, that's something we haven't seen before. And so what type of geography are we teaching children? You know, teachers are going to have to relearn subjects, and local governments are going to have to spend a lot more money and funding on teaching materials just because our climate is changing. But there's not a lot of focus on that. And I think that if policymakers look at youth and at least understand that we have a different perspective on things, right? We're looking at this world that we live in, and we have quite a bit more time on this earth, and I'm sure we want to see so much change. For me, it's an education or climate and, you know, other global issues like poverty and hunger. And so it just comes down to allowing the youth to use their voice and allowing free creativity and innovation to create solutions to tackle these problems. Yes, yes, fantastic. And you talk so passionately about this as well. <laughs> it's really fantastic to hear you speak. Now, we have run out of time. I'm going to be a little bit cheeky. Ella, just lastly and very quickly, um, what would be your key messages or advice to younger generations as they move forward? I believe that the best way to live up to your full potential is to try something new. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Whenever, whatever field you are today, or whatever job you're doing today, trying to think and try something new, different today. Yeah, absolutely. And that will lead to a better change for the world from today. There you go, guys. Brilliant bit of advice there from Ella. And please give it up for my fantastic panelists. Sorry, guys, I know we didn't have as much time as we'd like, but we, we, we got to the crux of it. So thank you, Otman, Zuriel, and Ella.